Morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today we are going to discuss social security disability as it relates to heart disease. Um, <clears throat> you may be aware February is Heart Disease Awareness Month and so <clears throat> I figured what a perfect time to cover social security disability for heart disease. Um, before we get started, I do want to say, as always, that today's webinar is not legal advice, but is instead intended to give additional background on the Social Security disability process, particularly relating to claims connected to heart disease. I also want to mention, you'll see as we go through, <clears throat> there are a slew of listings for heart disease in Social Security disability. We only cover three specifically, but I do list out all of them. So it's important. I, I want to get out there in front that if you don't see a listing that applies to you, it does not mean that there is not a listing in existence. I do put the list of listings, and so you can kind of take a look at that and, and surmise what might be possible on, on the listing side. But as far as going deep and detailed on listings, I only do that with, I believe it's three of them. So I wanted to get all of that out in the open. Today, we're gonna talk a little bit about social security disability basics. Same thing we do on every webinar, talk about some social security guidance, move into the potential listings and considerations, and then um, finally, how an attorney can help you with your social security disability case. A little bit about me. My name is Caitlin Wildoner. I'm the founding attorney of Beacon Disability PLLC, which is a law firm based in Florida. We assist clients with their administrative agency level disability cases, namely SSDI and SSI. If you have any questions, I do ask that you um, don't ask them on the live. What I will do is put a link in the chat on the live <clears throat> and then on the replays, that link is actually down below. If you have questions, please schedule a call. Um, the reason why I can't take questions on the live is because oftentimes there's more, more details needed um, for me to be able to give a correct and educated answer. And so I can't really suss that out through typing, through conversation like that. Even if we were to unmute and do it on the live, <clears throat> I don't want you to have to put all of that private information out there just to get an answer on your simple question. So I do ask that you schedule a call. Again, on the live, that link has been dropped into the chat and on the replay, that link is down below. So feel free to schedule a call. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. If it's not something that we can help with, I do try to help and point you in the right direction of somebody who might be able to help you. So with all of that being said, let's move on to social security disability basics. First, there are two different Social Security Disability programs. There's Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSDI benefits, and there's Supplemental Security Income, or SSI benefits. Both programs require that you be disabled and unable to work for a period of at least 12 months. That doesn't mean that those 12 months have to pass before you can apply, but it does mean that you have to be expected to be unable to work for 12 months. If you stopped working last month, the medical records will have to point to, in Social Security that you are expected to be out for at least 12 months. There's no really temporary Social Security disability benefits. Where the programs differ is SSDI is going to require that you have sufficient work credits, that you have worked and paid into the system long enough to qualify and receive SSDI benefits. We typically say that you have to have worked five of the last 10 years for SSDI benefits. And with SSI benefits, there's no work history requirement, but instead there is a there are income and asset restrictions. So you cannot have more than $2,000 in assets if you are single and more than $3,000 in assets if you are married and qualify for SSI benefits. That's the asset restriction. The income restrictions, they vary depending on um, the, the size of the family. So those, those are different, but they are also, they also exist. When you submit your application for social security disability benefits, the agency will first look before even this five-step evaluation process. The first step is, um, I don't know why I'm holding the highlighter, is to look on an SSDI case to see, do you have that work history? Have you worked enough and paid in the system enough to qualify for SSDI benefits. If you do, then they move on to this five-step evaluation. With SSI, they're first gonna look at, do you fall below their income and asset thresholds? 
If you do, then they move on to this five-step evaluation. And at step one, they're going to look to see, are you engaging in substantial gainful activity? Which means, are you working 20 hours a week or more? <clears throat> or are you earning substantial gainful activity amounts, which is about $1,400 this year in gross earnings? If you are not engaging in substantial gainful activity, the agency moves to step two, where they look at the medical records. And they are looking in there to see, do you have at least one severe medically determinable impairment? If you don't have at least one severe impairment, then the analysis stops there. The agency will say you're not disabled according to our rules. If you do have at least one severe medically determinable impairment, then Social Security moves to step three. And that is where they will look, do you meet or equal a listing? And as I said before, in a few minutes, we'll get to the first, we'll look at the list of listings related to cardiovascular disease. And then we will go and look at a couple of them specifically, just so you can get an idea of what Social Security is looking for in the listings. Um, you'll see that the listing level severity is a pretty high bar to meet. Um, so if you don't meet or equal a listing, then they move to step four, um, where they will review the medical records, create a residual functional capacity uh, status for you, um, and they will see, can somebody with that RFC go back to do your past relevant work? If you can go back to do your past relevant work with your RFC, then you're found not disabled. If you cannot go back to your past work with your RFC, then they go to step five to see, is there any other work that exists in the national economy that you could do? Okay, if there is other work that exists that you can do, then you'll be found not disabled. If there is no other work in the national economy that such an individual with your age, education, past work experience, and RFC, um, there's no other work that you can do, then that's you can be found disabled at step five as well. So it's step three and step five where they can result in a finding of disabled and where you'll get your favorable decision. Okay, here are the potential listings in section four, which is the cardiovascular system. Um, as you can see, they do cover from a wide variety of conditions from chronic heart failure to heart transplant to aneurysm. As you'll see, it's, it's a specific type of aneurysm. It's gotta be of the aorta or major branches, okay? Um, peripheral arterial disease, You there's, even recurrent arrhythmias. But as you'll see, and we're going to start with chronic heart failure first, um, it's got to be the, the records requested are so specific. So I'm not going to read all of this, but you can look and see, here's listing 402, which is chronic heart failure. You have to meet A and B. So you have to have the medical documents that show A is in existence and you have to have evidence that B is also in existence. And so for A, you have to meet either one or two. B, you've got to meet one, two, or three. And you have to be able to meet this while on a regimen of prescribed treatment. So you are seeing the doctor, they've prescribed medication, they've prescribed treatment for you, you're following that. And even still, you're having these issues, which can be documented through medical records. Okay. So that's, as you can see, it's a pretty high bar. Um, so just because you've been diagnosed with heart failure from your doctor does not automatically mean that you're going to meet the listing for chronic heart failure through social security. It also doesn't mean that you're not going to be found disabled at all. It just means that this listing is, is, has very stringent requirements. And if you can't meet or equal the listing, then like I said, kind of the other way to get approved is through step five by showing that your condition has such significant limitations on you um, that your RFC is such that you can't do any other type of work. Okay. Here is listing 4.06. There are three different ways that you can meet this. Um, and again, it, it relies on medical records. The medical records have to exist to show that either A, or B or C is met, okay? And it must be documented by appropriate medically acceptable imaging or cardiac catheterization. Okay, again, I'm not, not gonna read through it, but as you can see, if this is a diagnosis that you have, you can see how stringent the requirements are. Um, I did want to cover heart transplant because that one is one where it, it doesn't, you do obviously have to have the medical records to show that the heart transplant happened. But as you can see, the main way to be approved 
is by just having the heart transplant, which trust me is, is much easier to say than actually going through. But if you have a heart transplant, then the agency can consider you to be disabled for a year after that surgery. After the year, then the agency is going to look at your residual impairment. What limitations do you have as a result of your heart transplant? And it could be limitations that are not necessarily related to your heart, um, but you could have other issues going on. And so that's why it says to evaluate under the appropriate listing, okay? Considerations to make. Medical records are key in every single disability case, but as you can see just from the three listings that we looked at briefly, medical records are critical. You've got to have supporting medical evidence, and the medical evidence has to be more than just a diagnosis. I get calls at least a few times a month from people who have a diagnosis, but they are either not doing anything about it or the medication is controlling it and not giving any other side effects, um, or they just, they can't, they don't want to continue treatment. Um, with disability cases, medical records are so important. If you have the ability to see a doctor, you need to for disability purposes. The issue in social security disability cases is not just, can you go back to your past work? But can you perform any job that exists in the national economy? So that's what I was saying before at step five. It's not just can you go back to your past work? That's a factor. But if you can't go back to your past work, then the agency is going to look to see, are there any other jobs that you can do? It doesn't matter if you spent years of your career studying to be a nurse, a doctor, a teacher, a lawyer, an accountant. They are looking to see are there other jobs that exist in the national economy that you can do with your limitations? There are different, as I say in the next bullet, if you're 50 or older, the grid rules might apply depending on your specific situation. And that's where it's taking into account your age, your education, your work history, any transferable skills you might have from your work history. Taking all of that into play. Um, but the the issue is always going to be, can you perform any job in the national economy? Okay, so that is the, the issue in disability cases. Functional capacity can also be relevant. And again, driving the point home, objective medical records will be important. Any type of testing that you can do. Uh, I also want to make mention, since we are talking about cardiac cases here, um, to, to put forth good effort. Typically, you know, especially in the exercise tests and things like that, a lot of times the doctors will note whether or not you're giving a good or fair effort in doing the exam that they are putting you through. Um, it's very hard to fudge imaging, um, whether that's a, a chest X-ray or a CT or anything like that. Um, same with kind of um, other cardiac testing, but stress tests and exercise tests and things like that, give your good effort. Um, because if you don't, oftentimes the doctor will write in there that you didn't give a good effort. So these results are not totally reliable. And that report is not going to help. Um, it's important to always be honest, to always do what you can do, um, not just in your personal life for your own records, because it helps the doctors to create a care plan for you, but also from a social security's perspective. Um, it never serves to be dishonest because the agency looks at the whole person and the whole picture. So one terrible, you know, exercise report is not going to make the agency look at it and go, oh my gosh, wow, they must really be disabled in a bad way. Um, unless, of course, you know, the doctor is alluding to that throughout the record. But I, I say all of that just to say, always put forth a good effort. Always try to be as upfront and honest as you can. Um, don't sugarcoat, but also don't over exaggerate just to be honest and, and kind of let the doctors know what is going on in real time. So that way, like I said, it's not just from the Social Security's perspective, but also so that way they can try to create a care plan for you to try to get you back to some semblance of health. That's my soapbox for the day. All right. How can an attorney help you? Um, this is just a sample list. This does not include everything that we can do. And a lot of it depends on when you come to us as well. Um, we can provide guidance on what correspondence from Social Security actually means, but that's in real time as, as they're coming out. Um, if you come to us in enough time after getting a denial, we can file certain appeals. We can review your medical records in your case file. We discuss what additional records could be helpful in your case. Um, 
Again, depending on where you are, we can sometimes review your documents for accuracy and completeness. We don't fill the forms out for you. And the reason for that is you know what you go through on a daily basis better than anyone. And I, let me back up. We don't fill the function reports out for you. And that's because you know what you go through on a daily basis better than anyone. Um, we can review them for accuracy and completeness. We can have conversations with you about them. But as far as the actual completing of what you go through on a daily basis, we don't, we don't live with you. We don't have a camera in your home. We don't know what you go through. Um, so again, we are happy to review them. We're happy to discuss what they might be looking for in those forms. Um, but again, we always stress honesty and transparency. We can work back and forth with you and the agency to provide updates back and forth. Um, if you're at the hearing level, we would prepare you for the hearing before an administrative law judge. And if there are witnesses, sometimes we do different things with witnesses, um, but we can also prepare them if necessary as well on what to expect. Okay, we will go ahead and drop the questions in, or not the questions, the link in the chat if you have any questions. Um, to schedule a call, go ahead and click that link, schedule a call at a time convenient for you. Um, if you'd rather call or email, here is our contact information. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. As I said before, if it's not something that we can help with, we do try to put you in touch with somebody who can. So thank you so much for joining. Have a wonderful day.